the Bible and science. Many people think that they don't agree and that they're different and that it's something that, um, you know, we, especially when I was growing up, some people thought that it was, it, it was a part of where they were enemies, as you just saw in, in that uh, presentation there, where the Bible and science are enemies. But I believe, especially in the last 20 years or so, there have been discoveries that actually complement what the Bible has said and support the, the very histories, the historicity of the Bible where we think that the Bible is just some... Um, see, I used to think that the Bible was like a book that was inspired by men who possibly sat around with their eyes closed and just let God tell them what to write. But, you know, because it does, the scripture does say all scripture is inspired by God. And so when we look at that, we, I think we miss a lot, and, and it's just because of how we read into what we hear. And many times when our kids, or when we grow up, and then our, our kids grow up, and they go to school, especially once they hear college, and then you start hearing some scientific evidence, and then where there's some evidence that seems to contradict what you read in the Bible, then they don't know what to do with that. And there are a number of children, number of kids, who just turn away and say there's nothing to that because, um, in other words, if they never, especially if they never had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself, themselves. And so what this series is about is understanding that the, even the scripture, and we picked one book, we picked the book of Luke for this series, where if any book in the Bible is reliable, as history, then, and especially, and we talked about one main point. I don't know if you remember, we had a list of things that we believe, you know, that helps us to believe in Christianity, like um, we, you know, one being the Bible, you know, it's like, and then we talked about, well, what's the most important thing in the Bible? And we determined that if Jesus was not who can help me? If he wasn't crucified and resurrected from the dead, none of this matters. If that's not real, we might as well shut up shop. <laughs> shut up shop. I guess they say close shop, right? We might as well close shop, go home, do whatever you want to do. But if that is real, we need to make some decisions and make decisions based on that. So today's message, who remembers what we talked about last week? We talked about, <laughs> who, what? We talked about lost in plain sight. Remember that? The second son of the prodigal son? Lost. Anyways, it was just a test. I don't think anybody passed. Did you? Did you? Hmm. Okay, today, today our message is why follow, and it, it really in my heart I'm really talking about why follow Jesus, but really my question is why do you follow anyone? Why do you follow anybody? So why follow Jesus? We're going to talk about that, but why follow anybody? Especially for example, if you're considering today, if you are not a Christian, but you're considering becoming a Christian, then uh, why would you consider that? And what, what are some things that you need to consider? Following Jesus, you know, um, many of us, we, th we think about, um, some, there are some people who have been following Jesus and thinking about giving up church. Have you talked to some people who just say, well, you know, I did church and, and I just don't, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. It's, uh, many young people, different age groups, feel like church is, you know, I talked to somebody last night. They just felt like, you know, pastors. There was a person who told me that you, and I don't want to use this just because it, it was me they were talking about, <laughs> but they said, you're the only pastor that I know that I don't get the feeling that you're just in it for the money. And maybe they don't know very many pastors, but... <laughs> But 
for someone to say that, for someone to have the impression that it's all about the money, then um, that, that says a lot. But there are people who make decisions based on that kind of stuff, and it, and it shouldn't matter. That stuff shouldn't matter at all. But this is, you know, why I follow Jesus is the obvious question. And to, to really determine that is, do you believe and should we know that what Jesus said about himself is reliable? There are many things that Jesus said about himself. There are many things that other people said about Jesus. And whatever he said, is it worthy of us following him? There are many people you've heard many things about, and is, are they worthy of following? How many of you follow different people on social media? You follow this person, that person, that person. And so why do you follow them? Obviously, they probably have something that adds value to your life, or you believe that they do. And so I believe that, I believe that Jesus and the teachings that Jesus gave us is the most important thing that adds value to our lives if we implement them. And so, but as far as following, I found a statement here that I want you to take a look at. This is a statement by the Harvard Business School Review. And they said, what most analysis seem to ignore is that followers, and this is just talking about followers, and obviously with this um, article, they're talking about leadership, uh, people who lead companies. But what most analysis seem to ignore is that followers have their own motivations and are as powerfully driven to follow as leaders are to lead. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. If you're a follower of Jesus, then what is it that motivates you? What is it that causes you to want to follow Jesus? Um, and if you are a leader, what kind of leader are you? Are you a leader that inspires people to follow you? I was also talking to um, one of my brothers, and <laughs> this is so funny to me. He told me the, the leadership at work where he works is just draining mentally. They, they don't build the people up. A lot, of, a lot of negative things. He said he finally went to work one day. He said, I was sitting in the car, and I was dreading to go in. And I thought about it. He said, and I drove straight over to the union hall and quit that day. Retired, just done. Mostly just because of leadership and people. It's so draining when you're in, in that kind of environment where they don't, you know, build you up. Don't, don't. Why would you make somebody not want to come to work? And you need them to work. You need them to be happy at work. It's like you want them to be miserable. Country to the boss. Anyway, anyway. Okay. But what kind of follower, what kind of leader are you? If you are a leader, then there should be some people following you. If there's nobody following you, somebody said you're just taking a trip. You know, nobody's, you're just on your way somewhere. But what kind of leader are you? So what this message is to do it, it's going to challenge us in, in different categories of people. Those who believe that Jesus is God in the flesh then, and that he rose from the dead, this is going to challenge us to not just believe that, but to practice following him, practice following his teachings. And we've been looking at the book of Luke, and we've talked about all four of these gospels. You know, as far as history this is the only history that we really have, especially for a while, for centuries. This was the only history that we had of Jesus on earth was Luke, Mark, and Matthew, Luke, Mark, Luke, and John. And, but in the last few years, we've found other evidence that corroborates what these individuals have written. And we took a look at Luke, the book of Luke. Luke's gospel is special to me. It does a couple of things that some of the other even the other writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mark, and John, doesn't do. I believe they're all reliable. History shows that they're reliable. But Luke, the theme of Luke reflects on mercy. It reflects on the mercy of God. Uh, we've talked about a couple of different things in, since we've been in this series where, for example, think about we did the Good Samaritan, right, where the Samaritan was the person who showed mercy and compassion 
on a person who was his neighbor, who everybody else didn't think was a neighbor. But Luke, just he just digs into that kind of stuff. That's one of the things I like about Luke. But I want to show you a couple more things about Luke that's different than the other writers. Luke, first of all, is the longest book in the New Testament. All right? Luke's the longest. And he focuses on salvation for everybody, not just the Jews. Think about this. That was Jesus' ultimate message, is that salvation is for the whole world. It's for all people. Remember when we talked about John uh, the Baptist? When Luke introduces John the Baptist, he introduces him where he's saying, Behold the Lamb of God who took away the sins of who? The whole world. And he starts expanding. Luke, Luke makes sure he brings that kind of information in. Another thing is that his parables focus on people's response to grace. Think about all the different parables that all the other writers write about. But in Luke, his parable make you think, and the people, his audience that are listening to the parables, it makes them focus on grace. We talked about, last week, we talked about the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, two lost sons. But it makes you focus on God's grace and his mercy in all of those situations for the sheep it was because the sheep was lost. There's no way the sheep could find. And the, the shepherd is thinking about the safety of the sheep. No matter what the sheep did to get out away from the fold, he was disobedient, whatever. Instead of focusing on the disobedience and why are you not, why you leave, he just went looking for the sheep. That's amazing to me. If you think about a God that's like a judge, say God is like a judge. Thank you. Consider, consider God being like a judge, and he can, a judge can sentence you or give you mercy. Think about a judge who goes looking for someone who did something wrong for the purpose of giving them mercy. That's what God did. That's, he, he's a judge. He goes looking for the, per the sinner, the person who did something wrong, for the purpose of offering them mercy. That's what you don't see. That's what Luke is trying to get us to see. This is the kind of God that we serve. This is the kind of God that's offering us and inviting us to follow him. And so those kind of parables, and then his gospel was directed towards the Gentiles more so than any of the other three gospels. And then there are 15 parables in the book of Luke that are not in any of the other, par any of the books. And we talked about a few of those um, today. The, the Good Samaritan is only in the book of Luke. The Lost Coin is only in the book of Luke. And there's one other one that we went through that's only in the book of Luke. So... And think about this. This is the first verse we talked about. We're just bringing it back. Luke, when he wrote his first verse in opening up his book, he said, many have undertaken to draw an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. He's talking to Theophilus, but he's saying that many people have written, many people have stories about what has happened, talking about Jesus, his death and his resurrection, talking about all of these. He said, these things have been fulfilled among us. So here you have a reader that's a writer that's including himself in the story. These things have happened among us. And then he said, just as they were handed down to us, and many of the ways that they were handed down was verbally, they were oral. I mean, they didn't do a lot of writing, but oral communications where they handed down stories, stories, stories. How many of you have stories that you have from your family that the only reason you remember it is because of the stories you told over and over and over again. Like, I remember learning the 23rd Psalm when I was probably about six years old because we had to memorize. And my mother, this was so funny to her because I would get to the end of the 23rd Psalm and because I always tried to make words have a meaning, and when David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and my mother laughs about this every time she would think about it, 
And I will say, and I will squeeze in the house of the Lord forever. And, but that's why I, re, that's why I, can, I can put myself mentally back on that living room floor where we were sitting, where she was teaching us this when I was about six years old, where we were learning this verse, learning the whole 23rd Psalm. And where she's on the floor, we're on the floor. There was no carpet. There was no rug. <laughs> I'm talking about a floor <laughs> where we learned this. And so that's why. So there are many memories that I can associate with different locations and knowing where I was. And so this message is also to convince, not necessarily to convince, but to cause people to think about um, Jesus in a different way. For example, if you're not convinced, if you're not convinced that Jesus existed, then check out some historical evidence. If you don't trust the Bible, check out some other historical evidence, especially in the last 20 years, that will end up showing you that what's written in Luke, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and Matthew corroborates what they are finding now that they're able to uh, corroborate with what's actually in the Bible. Now, this message today... It challenges all of us to do this. It challenges all of us to think about what our world would look like. Think about this. What would our world look like if we all follow Jesus, his teachings, his way of living, how Jesus lived? If we followed how he lived, what would our world look like? It would be a very different world, wouldn't it? Very different place. So, Here's a question I have for you. If you're a Christian today, why do you follow Jesus? And, and, you know, have you ever thought about it? Many of us, we follow Jesus because of what, you know, the value that we can get from living his life. Or it's a prayer. If we need something, then we believe that, you know, we, we'll see if maybe he will answer prayer. But I want you to think about why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow Jesus? And I don't necessarily, I mean, if I see some answers here. Uh, <laughs> good morning. I see some of you talking. I mean, talk to me. Some of y'all are talking to other people uh, online. That's fine, you know, and bless you. But send, send me a message. I'll read it. I know, that's why you're not talking to me, right? You don't want me to say your name. It's like, all right, okay, I get it. <laughs> but, but if you're a Christian, why do you follow Jesus? And then if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, what are some of your reasons for choosing not to follow Jesus? And there, you know, I've heard many different reasons. Some people feel like there's insufficient evidence to show that it's, that it, what, who Jesus is is reliable, um, or that he existed. But do you know that all of the real historical data that acknowledges, there's historical data that acknowledges that Jesus existed. The only part that they don't acknowledge is that he rose from the dead and that he did miracles. But even the Quran that talks about Jesus as a prophet, many of those kind of uh, writings think that what he did was magic. Not miracles, magic. A lot of different writers that are out, secular writers that wrote about what happened, they said and he did these magical tricks. And, and even when Herod wanted to talk to Jesus when he was about to be crucified, he was hoping to see him do a miracle. That's, that's like somebody just saying, well, you know, do some magic for me. Because he healed people. They, don't, they didn't connect the, the compassion that was driving him to do what he did with what they call magic. If, he, if somebody couldn't walk and he healed them and they left walking, they're just like, okay, that's magic. He's doing something, you know, weird. Instead of just ascribing it to a miracle that he was actually doing what God called and told him to do. But there are a lot of reasons why many people don't believe that Jesus is who he is. But I want, to, I want to take you to this verse today, this, this part of Luke, the 23rd chapter of Luke. And it says that then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. 
This is after the night of Jesus doing his last supper with the disciples, and Judas actually betrayed him that night, and this is after the betrayal. What had happened was they had eaten together. Think about this. Jesus had just had his last meal with his disciples. He had washed their feet. They had eaten together, and even while they were eating, while Judas's hand was in the same bowl with Jesus, Jesus said, and I don't know who else's hand was in there, but Jesus said, the hand that's in the bowl that's sopping with me is the one who will betray me. That's heavy. And Judas left and sold him out and went and got a group of people. So after Jesus and his other disciples had done with everything they were doing, Jesus was going out to the Mount of Olives to pray like he normally did. And his disciples, the other 11 disciples are sleeping. They, they're waiting back, but they went to sleep. Jesus went to pray, and he comes back, and they're sleeping. And he said, wake, you know, wake up. Couldn't you just watch with me for an hour? He said, watch with me. And right while he's saying that, Judas comes back with a band of soldiers to arrest Jesus. And he comes up, and he kisses Jesus. And Jesus said, Judas, you betray me with a kiss? And they took Jesus, and after taking him to Pilate and even Herod, they determined, the people determined, and they told lies on him, but the people determined that they wanted Jesus crucified. And so here in the 23rd chapter of Luke, it says, then the whole assembly, talking about all these people, they rose and led him off to Pilate. So they, they're taking him to Pilate. So they can get Pilate to actually order a crucifixion for them. And they begin to accuse him, saying, we found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar. Did, have you ever read anything in the scripture where Jesus opposed them paying taxes? He actually said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. So they're Trump <laughs> lying. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're lying. They said he opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be the Messiah, a king. And so that's what's threatening to the government. If, is he, if he's saying he's a king, and that's what, that's what triggered, you know, Pilate, and that's what triggered Herod. And so they're like, so are you a king? And Jesus told him, well, you said that I am. I'm not, you know, you said I am, so that's what makes it. But Jesus, during this whole time, what I want to bring to you today is Jesus lived what he taught all the way up to his death. He lived what he taught. So take a look at this. Jesus, he talked love. He was always talking about love and compassion, and that's the way he lived. He followed his own teachings, or maybe his teachings followed his character. <laughs> Either way, they were one. He was one with the things that he taught. He taught forgiveness and justice and humility. That's who he was. But Jesus also lived the way he died. He died believing all of those same things. Do you realize that there's, there's one scripture where Jesus said that, you know, me and my followers, we don't fight. You know, we, if if He's, I could call down legions of angels to deliver me from this, but that's not my purpose. And so today what I want to just show you is something about the crucifixion that I'm not going to get into details of the crucifixion like some people do to make you think about, you know, oh, Jesus went through all this suffering, therefore I should believe that he died for me, and because I see how he suffered, then I want to give my life to Jesus. That's not, what, that's not what this message is about. But I want you to see something here. And we're going to go down to the 26th verse of the same chapter. It says, so now they've got him out there. They're crucified. It says, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. 
and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. So Jesus is on his way to the place where they're going to actually crucify him. Normally they carry their own cross. They had beat Jesus so bad that he was too weak to actually carry the cross. And there was a man named Simon who had come from Cyrene, who it, which is a nation, a country in northern of Africa. And so here he is, and they, they, soldiers make you do whatever they want you to do. So the soldier says, hey, you, over there, come over here and carry this cross. And so they get him. He comes over, carries the cross. And what we find out later is when, and this is just because of history. There's some stuff that you don't see in Scripture. But we see Simon, and there's other Scripture that talks about a person named Simon that talks about, but for example, History believes that this Simon became a Christian. You don't necessarily see that laid out in Scripture, but they believe that this, well, they know there's Simon was the father of a person named Rufus and Alexander, and then Paul does talk about Rufus. And then, so you see, when Paul is talking, this is like later, so they believe that this is Simon's family, and that's just some key information. That's why you need to look at some history and other stuff, too. <laughs> so, so it's assumed that Simon became a Christian and that his family became followers of Jesus. But going on, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. He's on his way to be crucified. But most people only followed Jesus to a point. How far do you follow Jesus? Most people followed Je that day, even his disciples, because they were still expecting him to be the kind of Messiah that was a king that was ruling and that not, Messiahs don't die. They were, they're waiting to see if this man dies, it's over. That's the way they felt about it. And so when we get to the 33rd verse, it says, when they came to the place called the skull, that's the place where they're actually going to raise up the cross, put and nail it to him. It says they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. There were two other thieves. There was another one named Barabbas. This crowd of people who had said that Jesus did all these things, Pilate was going to release Jesus because another murderer whose name was Barabbas was already in prison to be crucified that day. And they said, give us Barabbas and kill Jesus. That's, that's how you felt about it. And here you have the other two criminals on both sides of Jesus. And they're on the right side. They're on each side of Jesus. And everybody's crucifying Jesus. And what do you think, based on what we just looked at Jesus' character, what do you think Jesus did? Here's what Jesus did. Jesus said, Father... Forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Again, following his own teachings all the way to the death. Wanting God to forgive them. Everybody that's doing all this stuff to him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And he went on to say this. And... They divided up, not, he didn't say this, this is what was happening. While he's saying, Father, forgive them, look at what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. That means that they were gambling for his clothes as he's hanging on the cross. And then the people stood watching. They're watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. Who sneered? These are the people that are in charge. The rulers sneered even at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he's God's Messiah, the chosen one, let him save himself. So they're all, you know, pounding on. This is where you have the opportunity where you can show the compassion that God has for people no matter what people have done. There, there's things that some people have done that it's hard for us to get past. There's some people have done some stuff to you or especially to somebody you really care about, and it's hard for you to get past that where you can forgive them. It's, 
But this is what we need to understand in order to realize the power that Jesus actually makes available to us in order to forgive. Because if you don't forgive, then you are actually, you know, rotting inside, holding on to the stuff that you need to let go of. And so the soldiers, they also came up to him and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar. Now, I brought all this up to show you what all they did because I'm talking, I'm connecting history to what we're reading. The type of death that Jesus died, that was a crucifixion. We didn't go into a lot of detail, but the type of death that Jesus died was crucifixion. It was prophesied before crucifixion was even instituted or practiced. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, and I'm going to show you some years of when that was written, and then his store history of when crucifixions were begin. So let's look at Isaiah, where Isaiah says, and many of you, you read this, but it doesn't say crucify, because at the time it was written, there was no word crucifixion. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our sufferings, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. So far, we have enough, we as Christians, we know enough to know that this is talking about Jesus and his suffering, right? Right? But we don't necessarily see where this has anything to do with crucifixion. But look at the next verse. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And it goes on to say, we were all sheep, like sheep, having gone astray. Each of us having turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his prey. So when we look at that's prophecy, okay? Now, and that's talking about, that's a crucifixion style. But look at when crucifixion started. It was used by Persians and Assyrians and Babylonians in the, like the 6th century, 6th century. That's like... 600, between 600 and 500, see, B-C-E. How many of you notice that B-C-E, this is one thing. What is B-C-E? Years ago, it used to just be B-C. B-C means before Christ. Think about this. Our whole, the last 10,000 years is divided up the last 2,000 is showing what after death, A.D. means after death. And our whole organization of our calendars and everything is based on the birth of Jesus. This B.C.E. has been changed in the last few years to mean before common era. They want a secular way of saying the same thing without making it religious. So instead of saying before Christ, they just put an E on it and say before common error. And then CE means after death, and that means common error. So the common error began after Jesus. It's so, I was going to say stupid. But it's so crazy because there's, it's still the same event. They're just calling it a different name. It's real. He was born. The whole world knows and it's established. The whole calendar, everything is set up. Before Christ was all these other years, and after death was all the years afterwards. So, you can see I get a little emotional about this. But anyway, crucifixion, after the period, the Persians did this, 
It was later taken up by the Greeks under Alexander the Great. They used crucifixion for criminals and other individuals. But it was really perfected by the Romans. The Romans perfected it, and they, the years that they did this was between 200 BCE and 300 CE. So it was stopped in 300 CE by um, Constantine because he, that was the emperor of Rome at the time. He became a Christian. And he stopped all crucifixion. And that's when it actually ended. But here's what I want to show you. That during the reign of Darius, that's when the beginning of crucifixion was actually recorded. That was the king. That was, be, that was 522 to 486 BCE. That's when that happened. So that's like 500, at the most, 500 years before Christ was born. Right? Isaiah, who just wrote what we just read was written 700 years before Jesus was born. So that's at least 200 years before anybody knew anything about crucifixion. It was prophesied. So the, Jesus was, it was prophesied that he would die this kind of death. And way before there were any history of this kind of death being done, and so when you as a Christian, when me as a Christian, when we think about, when we say he was crucified for me, we need to understand that this was a way of death that was to be humiliating, that was to be shameful, that was to be demeaning. That's what, all, that's what Isaiah is saying. And we realize that even in history, other people use that same thing, but none of this was done before it was prophesied that Jesus would be crucified this way. And even th there's a psalm that David wrote when he actually talks about pierce my hands and pierce my feet, and it written way before the Persians started doing crucifixion. So here's your challenge today. It's like, okay, what's my challenge? Here's your challenge today, and it's a different kind of challenge. Your challenge is to respond to the facts See, we don't think about the Bible as fact. We think of the Bible as faith. I want you to respond to the facts and recognize that the faith that we have in the Scripture are based on facts. It's based on it really, this was an event that really happened. And if I believe this really happened, how should I live my life? So here's the challenge. If Jesus truly existed, if he really lived in the Middle East, if he performed miracles, if he was crucified and rose from the dead, what impact does that have on how I live my life right now? How, how should that impact my life right now? And how should it impact me preparing for the end of my life right now? How do I prepare for the end of my life right now based on the, if Jesus really existed? Um, because some people say that if Jesus didn't exist, there's, when you die, that's the end of it. You're done. There's no more life. Uh, there's no afterlife. And if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead and you believe there is afterlife, then how do you prepare for the end of your life? And how do you prepare? And what, how do you adjust your beliefs about eternity based on that. And so we'll give you a couple of ways to implement um, what we're talking about here. The first one is, the, the, this is what I call implementation intention, how you intend to apply what we just learned. Intentionally integrate Jesus's message. That's the key. Whatever Jesus taught and you know, Je whatever Jesus's character is and was, how do I integrate that into my daily activities? So here's a way to do that. So take a step to integrate the message of love, the message of forgiveness, the message of redemption into your daily activities until it resonates, until it becomes a part of your understanding of God's purpose for the entire human race. Why, do, why are we here? How does that resonate with, your, with love and forgiveness and redemption and humility? All of that works together because we are human beings on this planet that God loves and that he wants to actually be as a family to him, all of us. 
The second one is to ask yourself, and this is it, last one, ask yourself this question and then implement this. So ask yourself this particular question, then implement it. What aspects of Jesus' character, which is, you know, compassion, justice, love, humility, and forgiveness, what aspects of Jesus' character attract you? Which, I mean, you don't have to say all of them, but which one sticks out to you the most, that's most attractive to you? And then how might following him shape your life this week, focus on this week, and decisions that you have to make this week based on whichever of those characteristics attract you, whether it's compassion, whether it's justice. Uh, and justice could be not just for yourself, but for someone else. But how does it impact you that God wants justice? God also wants compassion. God also wants mercy, all of those things. So how might that, how might following him shape your life this week? And remember this last thing. We don't just believe, we follow. We're not just believers, we are Jesus followers. So if that's you today, I want to pray for you and give you an opportunity to connect with us um, so that we can follow up with you if you choose to connect with us. If, the, if what you've heard today is meaningful to you and you'd like to implement this into your life or even dig deeper and find out more about it, uh, you can connect with us and let us know whether you're here or if you're online watching us today, uh, engaging with us today, then you can still, you can scan this QR code and it'll bring up a form on your phone. Just take your phone, scan this QR code. Um, and um, when you scan this, it'll bring up a form that'll ask you some questions like if you, this is your first time. And anybody can use this, even if you've been here 20 times. You can still pull this up and because there's other areas that you, if you have questions about anything and you can let us know the step that you'd like to take and we will follow up with you as we begin to do that. So I'd like to pray for some people today. Um, some of you when it comes to Jesus and it comes to the Bible, you may not believe yet, but you may be curious. And I encourage you to continue searching, continue digging, continue, allow your curiosity to keep moving you. Be, stay curious. And so if you are curious, I want to pray a prayer and invite you to pray this prayer with me. And it's just a simple um, few words prayer. This says, Heavenly Father, I'm curious. If you would repeat that after me, please. Heavenly Father... I am curious. And I believe God hears you, and I believe that he moves and causes things to happen that would actually help your curiosity, bring some solutions to your curiosity. There's a second category, and that's if those are, these are the people who possibly walked with Jesus before, but you walked away. Could have been college, could have been church hurt, could have been the fact that there are hypocrites at church. <laughs> Whatever made you stop and say, well, I'm not doing that anymore. You walked away, but today you're ready to reconsider, and you'd like to reconsider being a Jesus follower again. There's a simple prayer that I'd like for you to pray with us, and those are just three simple words, just saying, I am back. So if you will repeat this after me, say, Heavenly Father, I am back. In Jesus' name, amen. And there's uh, one last category, and that's individuals who you've never given your life to Jesus before, but you'd like to take a step, and you'd like to do this for the first time, um, becoming a Jesus follower. And I, there's a prayer I'd like for you to repeat after me. And just follow me in this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe. I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he was buried. I believe he rose from the dead and was seen by others. I place all my faith in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And if you pray any of those prayers, uh, let us know. Scan the QR code or if you're here today and you'd like to talk to me about that, just let us know that you pray one of these prayers, and if you can complete the, uh, the, when you scan the QR code, you'll get a form. If you can complete that, 
then that will let us know how to follow up with you. So I want to pray with you and just, how many of you are ready to implement this in your life this week? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father, we thank you today. You've been so, so good to us. We thank you for the book of Luke, the entire Bible. But as we focus on the book of Luke, we thank you for the writings of Luke and how he just laid out even the parables and things that focuses on your mercy and focuses on your grace. It's our desire, God, to allow your, your character of forgiveness to work in our own hearts this week your character of grace to work in our own hearts this week. So your will and your purpose prevail. I pray uh, for, you know, men who have challenges with some of the things in Scripture and women who have challenges sometimes believing and children, students. I just lift them up to you today and pray that you would give us insight and even as a ministry, help us to find ways to actually invite people to who you really are, the grace that you really have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful day.